Thank you very much, Tina. Uh, you know, it's hard to believe that you were once my student. And just, I don't know to say how old it makes me feel, but um, yeah, it was, Tina was actually in my first cohort of graduate students, as was Jeanette Rowe, who's sitting next to Tina. So, um, and in fact, I just came from doing a reading at the Hammer at uh, UCLA, and another uh, of this cohort, Bridget Cooks, came to that, that reading. So it's, uh, it's been really great for me. So um, as Tina said, um, I'm going to read from, this is the, this is the book, um, Before Pictures, this is the cover of it. Um, and I'll just maybe explain that the cover photograph was taken by Zoe Leonard, uh, which came about because I asked Zoe to take photographs of each of the five apartments, buildings that I've lived in, in New York. And um, she had the wonderful idea of also taking photographs of the subway stops near those buildings. And those, uh, that those uh, pairs of photographs, building and subway stop, uh, form uh, chapter dividers in the book. And this is then one of the subway photographs that, from that series. Um, table of contents of the book, which will give you some sense of where this, um, this chapter, Action Around the Edges, falls chronologically in the book. The chapters are actually roughly chronologically, chronologically arranged. And um, you can see the most of the five places that I lived. I kept moving downtown. I started way uptown in Spanish Harlem, and every time I moved, I moved further downtown. And in fact, this chapter, Action Around the Edges, begins with um, a, uh, my actually talking about moving from Greenwich Village to Tribeca, why I did that. That's not, however, what I'm going to read. Um, so I, I start sort of uh, well into the chapter. Uh, and. It, as Tina said, the book is very um, fully illustrated. There are 160 some odd photographs in the book. But the photographs that I'm showing you here are not all in the book, including this one, and some of them are. But uh, Tina thought that it would be a good idea uh, to, to uh, for the purpose of some of you, I think, to um, make it clear exactly what the work that I'm discussing looks like. Gordon Matter Clark, whom you see here, is the figure most identified with the spirit of 1970s downtown Manhattan as a utopian artist community and site of artistic experimentation. His status, no doubt, derives in part from the fact that he died so young. His youth is all that we know of him. Uh, and his youthful career coincided with a moment of particularly intense artistic fermentation, a ferment. The identification also certainly has to do with the fact that the subject and site of Matt Clark's art was the city itself. The city experienced as simultaneously neglected and usable, dilapidated and beautiful, loss and possibility. Matt Clark wrote, and I quote, Work with abandoned structures began with my concern for the life of a city, of which a major side effect is the metabolization of old buildings. Here, as in many urban centers, the availability of empty and neglected structures was a prime textual reminder of the ongoing fallacy of renewal through modernization. The omnipresence of emptiness of abandoned housing and imminent demolition gave me the freedom to experiment with the multiple alternatives to one's life in a box, as well as popular attitudes about the need for enclosure. The earliest works were also a foray into a city that, that, that still was evolving for me. It was an exploration of New York's least remembered parts of the space between the walls of views outside, uh, inside out. I would drive around in my pickup 
hunting for emptiness, for a quiet, abandoned spot on which to concentrate my piercing attention. Hunting for emptiness in a dense urban fabric like Manhattan might seem incongruous, and indeed today, it would be well nigh futile there. But New York was a very different city four decades ago. I offer as evidence a group of photographs by Peter Hujar, dating from 1975-76, taken on the far west side of Manhattan, moving south from the meatpacking district toward, sorry, it's in my place, toward the Battery Park City landfill and around the financial district, toward a, a, um, sorry, financial district and civic center. Let me say that again. Taken on the far west side of Manhattan, moving south from the meatpacking district toward the Battery Park City landfill, which is what you see here. Uh, and around the financial district and civic center. The photographs are of two kinds. One showing desolate, fading industrial areas, and the other downtown Manhattan emptied out at night. Among the latter is one of Nassau Street that includes, in the middle distance, the building I moved into the year after Hugh Jar took this picture. All of them are, to my mind, cruising pictures. Cruising pictures with no people in them. This too must seem incongruous. But the point of cruising, or at least one point of cruising, is feeling yourself alone and anonymous in the city. Feeling that the city belongs to you, to you and maybe some, maybe a chance upon someone like you, at least like you in your exploration of the empty city. Is there by chance someone else wandering these deserted streets? Might that someone else be on the prowl? Could the two of us find a dark corner where we could get together? Can the city become just ours for this moment? Of course, not everyone experiences urban emptiness in this way. A year after Hujar made these pictures, Cindy Sherman began shooting her famous series of untitled film stills, also on the deserted streets of Lower Manhattan. Hers are a very different kind of picture, not least because most are taken during the daytime. They are also different because they always include a lone female character played by Sherman herself, and are staged in such a way as to suggest an incident in that character's story. The few of them taken on the streets at night are noirish images of threatened femininity, showing an apprehensive woman walking down a dark, forlorn street. But the city in Sherman's pictures is not New York. It is a gen generic city, like a film location. And the city is not a good place for the woman in the pictures to be. Of course, the notion that a city street at night is no place for a woman is also belied by Sherman's use of this very street to make her photographs. Now I'm jumping ahead a little bit um, after I've discussed um, another project um, on, which takes place on the piers and then come to uh, Gordon Mudd Clark's famous work, Day's End, which was made uh, on Pier 52, uh, adjacent to the meatpacking district at the end of Gansford Street. It's actually exactly where the, uh, the Whitney Museum looks directly out onto this pier. An indoor park, joyous, dangerous, absurd, flirting with the abyss, reading Gordon Matter Clark's and others' descriptions of Day's End, it's impossible for me not to think of the experiences of those other peer occupants, the ones from whom Matter Clark seems, in nearly all of his statements about the work, to want to differentiate, differentiate himself. You know, the whole S&M, as he put it. 
Although in many instances, he aligns his work with that of others who take over or otherwise make their mark on abandoned parts of cities, particularly workers, homeless people, and disenfranchised youth. In the case of Pier 52, Matter Clark not only disavowed any bond with the gay men who were using the piers as cruising grounds, but went so far as to lock them out. It may be that Matter Clark had no particular animus toward the gay men who were using the piers, but simply wanted to be able to go about his work undisturbed, to protect himself from intruders of any kind. He might even have worried about liability should someone get hurt as a result of his cutting away sections of the pier's floor. It's difficult to say, however, because Matter Clark wasn't careful to differentiate among the various dangers that journalists in their writings about the piers often conflated. Hazardous, disintegrating structures, threatening, perverse sexuality, and criminals who preyed on, robbed, and sometimes even murdered the peers' clandestine users. Gay men were acutely aware of the peers' dangers. In fact, they posted signs warning fellow cruisers to watch their wallets. Moreover, Matter Clark wasn't the only one who took to the peers for a summer vacation by the water. Shielded from public view by the warehouse structure, gay men used one of the peers, one pier's end that jutted out into the river as a place to sunbathe. It doesn't, I think, diminish the accomplishment of Day's End to say that a romantic grandeur was perceptible in the human peers before Matter Clark ever wrought a single change on Pier 52, and that much of the pleasure gay men took in, the, it, uh, in being at the piers was what drew artists to them as well. It's not just that they were there and available, they were also vast and hauntingly beautiful. Nor was the sex play in the piers only of the rough and kinky variety, unless you think that any kind of sex outside of a domestic setting is kinky. The entire range of pleasures and dangers at the piers was captured by the too little known African American photographer Alvin Baltrop, who documented the goings on there during the 70s up to and including the Pierce demolition in the mid to late 80s. A number of Baltrop's photographs show gay men at Pier 52 taking in the beauty of Day's End along with whatever other beauties they might have been pursuing. Indeed, these photographs wonderfully portray the peaceful enclosure and joyous situation that Matter Clark said he wanted to achieve. Baltrop photographed obsessively men engaged in sex, shot from the distance of a neighboring pier, or clandestinely through a doorway, or happy to become exhibitionists for the camera at close range. In, <clears throat> sorry, including, <clears throat> including some who had, sorry, I I'm, I'm, I'm lost my place again. Men and women Baltrop came to know at the piers, including some who had no place else to live. Guys cruising for sex, sometimes as naked as the nearby sunbathers. Some just strolling around, transfixed by the rays of sunlight streaming through the disintegrating roof structures. Graffiti and vernacular artworks, some of it the skillful handiwork of an artist known as Tava, who painted in a style that amalgamates Greek vase painting with Tom of Finland. <laughs> Gruesome corpses dredged up from the river and surrounded by the police and onlookers. Most of all, Baltrop photographed the piers themselves. The phantoms of New York's bustling industrial past appear in Baltrop's pictures as vast heaps of trusses, buckled tin siding, rotting pilings and floors, rickety staircases, broken windows, sometimes with a ragged curtain still fl flapping in the river breezes. Baltrop's camera often zeroes in on a just discernible scene of butt-fucking or cock-sucking amid the rubble. But even when the sex is absent, the peers can be recognized as the sexual playground they were. 
Now I'm going to skip quite a lot further toward the end, and to the very end actually, of this chapter, and I will read the final few pages. Of it. <clears throat> and maybe I should explain that um, each of these chapters is um, occasioned by, or takes as its as its um, as its premise, a uh, something that I did in this period, this first ten years that I was in New York, leading up to the picture show, some uh, career um, event, such as working at the Guggenheim Museum or organizing an Agnes Martin exhibition or writing for Art News, and this particular chapter was instigated by the fact that I had written uh, in 1976 an essay on the performance work of Joan Jonas uh, for a, a um, special issue of Studio International, a British magazine devoted to performance art. It was one of the early special issues devoted to such a, a subject. Um, and I begin the chapter by talking about why I moved from the village to Tribeca, um, thinking that I needed to become more serious about being an art critic and not spending all my time playing out my front door. Basically. <laughs> um, I didn't manage to change worlds by mo moving to Tribeca. I still spent nearly every evening in the village, but now most of them ended with a long walk down the west side to my new neighborhood through the empty streets that Hugh Jar photographed at just this time. It was a time when I could cherish the illusion that these Manhattan streets belonged to me, to me and others who were discovering them and using them for our own purposes. But I did manage to become an art critic. The first article I wrote after moving downtown was Joan Jonas's performance works published as a special issue of, in a special issue of Studio International devoted to performance art. Jonas was more clear-sighted than I about the possibility of appropriating city spaces. I quote her in my essay as saying, and I quote here, my own thinking and production has focused on issues of space, ways of dislocating it, attenuating it, flattening it, turning it inside out, always attempting to explore it without ever giving myself or to others the permission to penetrate it. I was still preoccupied enough with painting in the mid-1970s that I misinterpreted Jonas's exploration of spatial illusionism as reflecting her continuing involvement with the history of painting. I overlooked her statement, what her statement foretold about the actual spaces Jonas was performing in, just how provisional was their availability for experimental uses. This is what her film Song Delay, can I show you some stills from it? Her film, uh, this is what her film Song Delay captures so well about the New York of its moment. Robert Fiore, her cinematographer, Robert Fiore's use of a telephoto lens in shooting Jonas's film collapses onto a single plane, the vista that opened out in front of the spectators beyond the roof top from which they watched Delay Delay. Delay Delay is the performance, the actual performance work that, uh, whose material provided um, the impetus for the film of a year later called Song Delay. A performer who appears to, to be in the near foreground claps blocks of wood together. A sound delay tells us that in fact he stands a great distance from us. A warehouse in Jersey City appears to be right behind him. But the sudden, uncanny arrival of a huge freighter between him and the building tells us otherwise, that it lies between, that in between lies the great expanse of the Hudson River. A cut to a slow motion tight close up of Jonas, limbs outstretched and rotating in a large hoop, makes clear how limited and fragmented is our perspective of the overall location. Far beyond Jonas's torso, we see only 
Uh, for Beyond the Jonas the Torso, we see only the street's cobblestones, a curb, a bit of sidewalk, and some rubble.